what is the incidence of inadequate pre oxygenation in my presentation i have shown one slide that the incidence of pre oxygenation in one study was found to be 56% but uh, in 2018 in british journal of anesthesia one article was published it was a multi center prospective study and it was found that in nearly 30% of patient there is a difficulty in pre oxygenation so 56% is a very 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 high uh, incidence of pre oxygenation so pre oxygenation must be a very important part and should be strictly followed what are the factors associated with the inadequate pre oxygenation there can be facial deformities in the patient or uh, if the mask is not a mask is not properly sealed over the face if proper instructions are not given by the doctor or not followed by the patient of uh, pre oxygenation all these things can lead to uh, uh, inadequate pre oxygenation and uh, inadequate stores definitely definitely sir if leak is there then you cannot achieve 100% pre oxygenation how do you define adequate pre oxygenation first of all uh, pre oxygenation as we all know is the administration of oxygen to a patient before that patient is intubated this is done to extend the uh, safe apnea time and delay the onset of hypoxemia if the intubation is Uh, taking a long time, especially in unanticipated difficult airways. So, uh, adequate pre-oxygen uh, to um, to say whether the uh, pre-oxygenation has been adequate or not. Uh, there there are certain uh, reliable indicators. The first of all, as uh, Dr. Bhargav had very succinctly told in his presentation, is the end tidal uh, partial pressure of the oxygen. so it should be more than 90% um, uh, this value of more than 90% tells us that adequate denitrogenation has occurred which is our target in the pre oxygenation any value which is less than 90% would indicate inadequate denitrogenation and would require some other efforts like uh, the application of pressure support or peep to increase uh, the end tidal oxygen concentration uh, secondly uh, there is an entity known as the oxygen reserve index uh, which is uh, which is coming up uh, it is a continuous non invasive measure of the uh, oxygen reserve in the patient so it is just like uh, the probe is just like the uh, pulse oximeter probe and uh, it has a score that lies between 0 to 1 and measures the pao2 from 100 to 200 mm of mercury so uh, pao2 of 100 is the value wherein the blood becomes saturated with oxygen and that is the time when the mixed venous oxygen saturation starts to rise so uh, and and this uh, plateaus at around 200 mm of mercury so uh, when we are, when we are using this oxygen reserve index and we find that the value is coming down from 1 towards 0 so it is a very good indicator which tells us that the patient is now uh, losing his oxygen and perhaps when it reaches a low value we know that we need to take other measures to prevent hypoxemia well in advance uh, now you know uh, using this oxygen reserve index sensor i i feel that if the patient has uh, an arterial line we can even measure the pao2 to give us a good indication of uh, what the uh oxygenation level of the patient is and in in and in places uh, where these fancy things might not be available like etco2 or oxygen reserve index in say emergencies or out of ot scenarios in mri or some places even uh, spo2 would be a good indicator if if we are able to maintain a saturation of 100 then we can say that the patient has a good oxygenation level although the denitrogenation level which is our target during pre oxygenation will not be predicted so uh, this is it nicely nicely explained so spo2 can be an can be an indicator but it's not a reli- reliable indicator you yeah. want to say yeah, yeah. Uh, so reliable indicator would be the uh, eto2 reliable indicator it, would be it, 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 eto2 or tidal, guess yeah and tidal oxygen concentration or oxygen reserve index uh, for with the with the pre oxygenation there are uh, the three things arterial uh, venous and the tissue 
every uh, every part should be saturated with the oxygen yes nicely explained what are the conventional devices available right now for pre oxygenation uh, yes so the device that all of us uh, use almost exclusively universally is of course the face mask you know <clears throat> and the advantages of the face mask are you you place a face mask over the patient and um, do tidal volume breathing for about 3 to 5 minutes and that gives you a very good pre oxygenation and alternatively if the patient is cooperative you can ask for 6 to 8 uh, vital capacity breaths so that is the most common device that is used by all of us uh, apart from that some people also including me i also tend to use the hudson mask so what i do is when the patient is wheeled into the ot i place a hudson mask with a flow of around 8 to 10 liters per minute and uh, let the patient keep breathing till the time that i my residents or me we put in the monitors and everything so that gives you a good amount of time for pre oxygenation some people have also used nasopharyngeal cannula uh, nasal cannula but those are the ones that are uh, commonly used ones are the anatomical face mask with your breathing circuit or uh, the hudson mask uh so what do you think dr bedi uh, are these method conventional using method are effective as effective as hfnc or uh, there are uh, some shortcomings or limitations of face mask and nasal cannula uh in terms of uh, uh, their effectivity in pre oxygenation uh, to ensure adequate oxygen reserves yes i would say they are as effective as hfnc definitely in terms of uh, their capacity to provide pre oxygenation there are of course uh, certain shortcomings uh, one of course is the is the amount of time that is taken for pre oxygenation and especially for people uh, who are working in, uh, in in medical college hospitals or in busy Uh, corporate hospitals what happens is that 3 to 5 minutes is uh, sometimes seems to be too long a time you know you have the surgeon uh, standing right next to the patient aksab jaldi kar do mere aur bhi case baaki hain adjust kar do so that does take uh, more time uh, than is you know comfortable to everybody around that's a practical problem i believe all of us have faced at some point of the time or the other and secondly if you put in a nasal uh, wrong or a nasopharyngeal catheter to pre oxygenate the patient that might actually be uncomfortable to the patient uh, there might be dislodgement that might cause drying so those are um, certain uh, functional or uh, you know uh, practical uh, i won't call them disadvantages but maybe a yes, shortcomings in uh, conventional methods of pre oxygenation as compared to hfnc but in terms of uh, the efficiency of providing pre oxygenation yes it is as good as uh, hfnc the conventional methods takes more time but uh, probably does Uh, an equally good job what are the tidal volume breathing and vital capacity bre- breathing method for pre oxygenation uh this uh, actually uh, the pre oxygenation technique we have discussed is the two types of technique is the one is a tidal volume breathing and the vital capacity breathing as the is a conventional method we are providing the uh, oxygen flow of 12 liter per minute by the face mask for the 3 minute it is a effective it's mean you can say this is alveoli arterial venous as it full of the oxygen this it's mean it's indirectly indicated that there is a pre nitrogenation it's a one it is a slow technique uh, by that it have to take the 3 minute prior to the induction of an anesthesia uh, this is a known as a tidal volume breathing and second technique is known as a deep breathing technique in that case is a vital capacity breathing you can say it's mean there is a rapid a uh, rapid uh, inspiration expiration uh, that's in the in the 60 second uh, it's you can say the eight eight uh, deep breathing in the 60 second is a deep breathing uh, it is uh, both are the applicable in the different scenario if the in cases of an emergency conditions there is a deep breathing is very effective and otherwise in the pregnancy uh, in the, in the, and in the obstet- uh, ob is patient in the high risk patient and it is a very helpful uh, this is a pre oxygenation because this pre oxidation is a helpful for the denitrogenation as you previously our panelists told so both are the useful method uh, whether both are the useful which pre oxidation practice you are following in your institute <laughs> ours is a teaching institute so there are a good number of residents also so theoretically all the residents they know how to uh, pre oxidate uh, it's a 3 minute tidal volume breaths or uh, eight vital capacity breaths theoretically everyone knows but i have seen some funny ways of pre oxidating when i go to ot someone says baba aaram se lamba lamba saans lo 
and what does that mean baba gets confused <laughs> so he doesn't know what what does that mean of aram se lamba lamba saans lo so there are a lot of funny ways but ideally yes every resident knows and they should know uh, that uh, it's a uh, normally what we do is uh, we use the circuit that uh, the patient uh, that the resident is going to use after pre oxygenation so that there is no change over of circuit so normally it's a uh, uh, breathing circuit close circuit through which uh, uh, 10 to 15 liters of oxygen is delivered normally though it is very heavy and bulky a bit but then uh, uh, if the uh, intubation is supposed to be easy then they oxygenate uh, uh, through a face mask with the same breathing circuit 10 to 15 liters and uh, uh, three minutes tidal breaths they are supposed to uh, be doing but then as i said baba lamba lamba saas lo aram se saas lo some weird kind of uh, uh, breathing pattern uh, they are though i normally interrupt and ask what does that mean and how can any person take vital capacity breaths for 3 minutes it is impossible no one can do that so uh, being a teaching hospital uh, they have their some funny habits which we have to correct so uh, you can say it's a normal 3 3 minutes of and uh, normal tidal breaths okay. and baby uh, dr baby Uh, just just, like to to add, ju- yeah. just just to add to what uh, bhatia sir said you know the i think this is universal baba lamba lamba saas but what what we tend to do is that uh, i've k- kind of tried to devise a way wherein we actually ask baba to saas andar saas bahar so that uh, kind of sometimes helps to give uh, a little bit of direction to the patient you know breathe in breathe out breathe in back breathe out i don't really know if it uh, goes a long way towards enhancing adequate pre oxygenation the way we want it but yes it does cover a uh, little bit of distance i believe and the next the, the other method of course is the use of a hudson mask that i feel i feel is very effective you know as soon as the patient is brought into the ot you put a hudson mask and then you go on to uh, check your uh, intravenous lines and put in your monitoring and draw your drugs and uh, take the baseline measurements that generally gives you 4 to 5 minutes of oxygen that uh, 8 to 10 liters per minute 12 liters per minute and it does a good job dr sisodia one thing i want to add Yeah. Uh, this the uh, deep breathing and tidal volume breathing is a uh, uh, this uh, Dr. Bedi has rightly told and Bar uh, Sir Sir says uh, perfectly. Like uh, one thing is more that like, there at time the uh, this uh, tidal volume breathing, this a uh, mass size should be perfect, adequate. This should not be leak. And uh, otherwise, we have generally uh, give the pre-oxygenation by the general uh, venti mask, uh, face mask, and this thing, and that is uh, not effective. and yeah. uh, we in in the our our uh, ot is and we told the resident to use the proper adequate size of mask this should not be leak and one thing is more that it is the position head position slightly thoda little up 25 degree head up and simultaneously the flow the flow generally we use 5 to 6 liter of flow but this is not effective so uh, uh, for the in scenario of the pre oxygenation is that the two thing is very important one is the flow should be around 10 to 12 liter flow Otherwise, the generally resident keep the flow is at a six to eight liter. Second, then use the adequate size. Uh, they should not be leak and head up points. Yes, doctor, sir, you point out a very valid point that flow should be high. Uh, uh, I think I think we have covered almost anything. One thing that I wish to add is that the uh, anesthetist who is pre-oxygenating should keep the level of the uh, OT table at uh, at a comfortable high so that Uh, this this problem of the mask not snugly fitting to the patient despite the mask being of proper size does not occur i have seen this happening uh, with with you know uh, uh, when the anesthetist uh, are of different heights so so one one anesthetist who is very tall uh, you know uh, increases the height of the patient and then a, a shorter anesthetist comes and finds it difficult so this is another thing that in the heat of the moment should not be missed the height of the table is equally important along with a raised head end and 10 to 12 liters of oxygen with a snugly fitting face mask yes thank you thank you very much all what is apnea ventilation when the patient is oxygenated uh, in the absence of uh, either spontaneous ventilation or mechanical ventilation uh, this is basically the apnea apneic ventilation uh uh before before we get on with apneic ventilation it is important to denitrogenate the lungs by ox- uh, by use of 100% oxygen uh, otherwise the nitrogen which remains in the lungs along with the expired co2 would 
uh, would drastically reduce the apnea time that we are wishing to prolong. So uh, uh, ap apneic ventilation depends on uh, the diffusion of oxygen from the alveoli into the pulmonary vessels and this happens because uh, uh, the rate of diffusion of oxygen is around 250 ml per minute whereas the rate of diffusion of carbon dioxide from pulmonary vessels to the alveoli is around 10 to 20 milliliters per minute. So uh, a subatmospheric uh, pressure is created in the alveolus which, which causes uh, the uh, dragging of uh, drug uh, of the air from airways uh, above the alveolus which is known as the uh, <clears throat> air ventilatory mass flow. So uh, in, in effect this subatmospheric pressure is the one that is responsible for the uh, apneic ventilation. Okay, so uh, it should be named as apneic diffusion. Yeah, it can be called as apneic diffusion also. Uh, actually, we should not be calling it uh, a ventilatory because if this carbon dioxide is getting exchanged, then that means some ventilation is occurring. That ventilation could be because of the cardiac oscillations or the movements of uh, lungs causing uh, movement of the heart uh, causing some areas of lungs to be compressed and uh, the carbon dioxide getting pushed out. So, um, it is, it is not exactly a ventilatory in my opinion. Yeah. So there are, uh, uh, two things which are confusing. So, uh, what do you think? Is there any difference between the apneic ventilation and a ventilatory, a ventilatory mass flow or both are the same thing? Uh, apneic ventilation is the process that is happening. Uh, Apneic ventilation consists of uh, two parts. One is the movement of air from the airway to the alveoli. That is the uh, mass flow that is happening. And second part is the diffusion of the oxygen from the alveoli into the blood vessels and uh, carbon dioxide from blood vessels into the alveoli. So uh, they are not exactly one and the same thing, but apneic mass flow is a part of the apneic ventilation. You know, uh, it is one of the two uh, processes that is happening. So it clears our confusion. Thank you.